So there are five things I wanted to sort of do today. I don't know if you came with your three points, but I will start out by talking about Aristotle's virtues and vices. And you might already have written down what you want to talk about, but while I'm talking, you might add some things or, you know, just think of more stuff. And then I'm going to put you on in small groups. And at the and there are there were a list of questions at the end of that long reading. So um, you could have answered some of those questions in your small groups. You can uh, go through all of those questions and just chat about them. Like there's not any one answer. So that's the first round is the Aristotle's virtues and vices and then the questions at the end. Then the second round, I'll bring you back and we'll talk a little bit about Jesus. And um, I, I think I'll talk about how Jesus had those virtues and how Socrates had those virtues. And then um, I'll put you into, I'll tell you that when in the rest of the class, we are going to read about Buddha and Muhammad and Martin Luther King and Gandhi. And we're gonna go through these and Confucius. And we're gonna go through all this list of virtues again and just say, did they have those? Did they exhibit those? But you have your own ideas about that. If you've been raised Muslim or Buddhist, or um, if you can think of some other people you know that you really look up to, you could talk about how they have those virtues. And then the last thing I wanna do is there was a link to a, an article published today, yesterday about um, the polarization in America and how it's connected to Puritanism. And in America, we have these two traditions. We have the Puritans, or there's one way to describe it, which is relevant to this class. It's a humanistic, type of Christianity, and then it's a puritanistic, a puritanical um, version of Christianity. And then you can say, you know, is there a humanistic version of Islam and a puritanical version of Islam, right? Is there a humanistic version of Buddhism and a puritanical version? So that's kind of a summary of what I'd like to do today. So let's start out with Aristotle's virtues. And I, I actually, I shouldn't call them Aristotle's because I'm just gonna call them the classical virtues because obviously if they're in Buddhism and Confucianism and Islam and um, in uh, Christianity, I shouldn't call them Aristotle. <laughs> he, he wrote books where he articulated them, but he didn't make them up out of the blue, okay? He, um, they're, they're based, I think they're based on the human condition. So he could have figured out a lot of them, but he also uh, talked to other people. He knew Greek tragedies. He knew a lot of literature. And so he learned about, he learned to recognize these patterns. He didn't just make them up off the top of his head. And they aren't true because he said so. They just, to me, they make a lot of sense. Um, so that's, I want you to write down anything you'd like to talk about in your groups or on your post. All right. So the idea here is there that even though we are blind and ignorant and we uh, oftentimes we're blind, we, we think we're being virtuous and we're not because we don't see certain things with our minds. We block them out, we were never exposed. We have some sort of emotional imbalance, but that doesn't mean that we can't try. So this is the model that says you keep trying and you keep self-correcting, right? You know you aren't God, you can't see it all. 
but you have to try, right? Constantly try to get wiser. And wisdom means to actually see what's out there, to actually understand people the way they are, to actually empathize with people, uh, sympathize. In other words, to expand your mind as much as possible in a way that's as accurate as possible. Um, so the goal is to flourish. That's a wise person is a completely flourishing person. Um, so we have this capacity to understand patterns in the, in the universe. So that's science and physics, chemistry, biology, all of them are uh, articulating patterns in various aspects of the natural world. Um, there's patterns in human affairs. And that's where um, poetry, epic poetry, the Greeks had music and dance and epic poetry and history and um, comedy and tragedy, all of them were based on trying to articulate a certain pattern of good and evil and trying to educate people to seek <laughs> virtue, seek the good and avoid the evil. Um, and this, the soul means psyche. So psyche is a biological term. It's our biological um, destiny to try and understand patterns, to desire to know. Um, all right. We're born with the potential to develop these virtues because of the human condition. And also children begin life acting, right? They're always acting. And they're either taking pleasure in acting a certain way or their parents are forcing them to and they don't really want to. Then it's not part of their character or um, anyway. So their character is being developed through what they do and what they take pleasure in doing. Um, and eventually that develops into a habit and that can the habits can get pretty entrenched. But once you become an adult and you can reflect on your behavior, you need to constantly examine and re-examine what your assumptions, your thoughts, your actions, your emotions, in order to constantly improve, get, get flourish to a higher degree. Each virtue is connected with some aspect of life that you experience it's in, in some degree, every human being has had this kind of experience or sometimes they haven't, but they can understand that they could have. I, I can understand that <laughs> even though I haven't ever been in that situation, I can I understand can. how easily it is to get into that situation and that I could have that reaction. Um, each virtue avoids two extremes. So it's always a middle ground and cultures disagree on what those extremes are, but every culture has some acceptable kinds of anger. For example, anger is one of them. So um, anger is e being even tempered or having the virtue in relation to situations that trigger anger, right? You can get too angry, you can get not angry enough. Okay, so different cultures allow for different degrees of anger as considered normal um, or healthy. And then in patriarchy, men are often allowed to be more angry, uh, get angrier and get angry more often than women are. Um, and then you can, you know, I don't, think that's fair. <laughs> I think that's another layer of the way people are oppressed is that they're silenced and they have to be submissive. Um, but let's see. But every culture has some idea of too much or too little in relationship to situations with anger. That's the kind of way of thinking where some things are universally true or they're based on the human condition to some extent and then some of them are purely cultural but every culture can be evaluated according to whether it promotes flourishing or inhibits flourishing um, and 
yeah, this is subtle. It can easily be misinterpreted. Um, people project themselves into the model, uh, but that the model itself requires constant examination. So if you're disagreeing with somebody about whether that's over overreacting or not, you have a debate about it, right? And then someone from another culture says, I think you're both wrong, but you still assume you know what you're talking about, that everybody has the same subject matter in mind. And so, so there has to be something in common and then you disagree on what the best way to manifest this is. Okay, so self-control, that would be the most obvious. The, the first two are the ones connected to our survival instinct, right? So my grandson is in seventh grade. He's about to go through puberty, right? <laughs> so he's going to be experiencing feelings of aggression, right? and sexual pleasure and aggression also. So sex and aggression is the hormones are about to hit and um, everybody sort of knows that that's part of life. So even, but before when kids are little, they, ha they have to learn self-control. They have to learn not to be impulsive. They also have to learn not to be too afraid or not afraid enough. And so as you watch a kid getting raised, you can realize that, that there's a lot of things a little kid uh, could be afraid of because they're vulnerable. So unless the parents are pretty um, careful, uh, a kid can grow up to be pretty phobic. They can be afraid of everything. Um, or they can be too not afraid enough, right? they don't understand that some things need to be feared. <laughs> so that starts way before puberty. It just kicks up quite a bit. Um, so people disagree on these things, um, but there still is some sort of a mean, right? So with eating, for example, um, some people eat meat and some people don't, right? Some people, so in general, it is kind of interesting to me how over you know, many centuries, the people who lived in certain areas of the world sort of figured out how to feed their bodies given the geography, like what it was possible to grow there. And they, you know, they just think about it and they come up with a decent diet within the context of where they live. And so now we have a whole science of this and we know the protein and the calcium and the vitamins and all that stuff. It doesn't mean we actually follow that, however. <laughs> so we have the most knowledge and we also are destroying our bodies with our self-indulgence, with our inappropriate food, uh, processed food and things like that. So I think everybody would agree that some foods are better than others. And you can eat too much or too little. You can eat the wrong things. You can eat um, for the wrong reason. You can re eat for emotional reasons, not healthy. Um, you can eat in the wrong way. You're supposed to not eat too fast because your body can't digest it if you just gulp it down. Um, you're supposed to not, I think you're supposed to not eat at night, but I don't pay any attention to that because... <laughs> I like to eat at night, so forget it. Um, so anyway, there's the body has its needs and, and human beings absolutely have to learn how to do things like eat because their destiny is to understand why. And so once they start understanding um, what you need to eat and why, they also are aware that they have a choice. Like they don't have to do what is best. And so that consciousness, human beings just have this higher level of consciousness. Um, they don't eat st strictly by habit. They do as children, but by the time they're in college, you have to link your habits 
you have to look at your habits in light of reason. So for example, maybe your parents raised you eating really healthy food and you hated it because all your friends got to eat junk food. And then you've come to college and go, oh, now I know why my parents made me eat that way. It's actually a lot healthier. And then you have to decide, you know, well, am I going to eat that way or not? Um, and then if you go to call, if you decide, gee, my parents really gave me a bad diet, like they didn't even realize how bad processed food is or the carbon footprint of the stuff we were eating. And so then you have to decide, do I want to think about the carbon footprint when I decide what I'm going to eat, right? I do, but I don't as much as some other people do, right? But I'm aware of that. And your generation actually should be even more careful about carbon footprint. But I don't know if I've ever had a student who told me that they, that's how they decide what to eat. They're very, well, I, I have had some like Rossi. <laughs> I shouldn't say that. Um, but I, I do recommend that because you're going to live in a world with a lot of climate change. So I would recommend that you start thinking about the carbon footprint of the things you eat. Um, but that hasn't been the main issue in the past. That's something that sort of has changed with time. That's something your generation has to deal with. But anyway, you can eat too much, too little, blah, 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 blah. And then with courage, it's another really big drive. And so human beings can get very phobic. They can become too afraid or not afraid enough. So a great example of that is COVID, right? Some people are not afraid enough of COVID and the spread of COVID, and they just do whatever they want. Other people are maybe too afraid, right? Uh, I don't hear about them in the news, but certainly there could be people who, who don't even get out the door to eat or something because they don't want contact. Um, but anyway, that would be for the most part, I would say people are not afraid enough based on reason, based on what the scientists tell us. Um, so the social scientists can tell us how people are habituated or conditioned. And sometimes they're conditioned to follow what the scientists say. That would be good social conditioning. That would be a healthy, a flourishing society is one where the people want to do what the scientists say they need to do to flourish. And um, an unhealthy society, right? A, an, a less flourishing society, does this, the people are conditioned to deny the problem or to, I mean, not pay attention to the scientists. So that I, that's one example of, yes, every society, societies differ a lot in what to be afraid of and how much, but still, there's still some basic things and there's a natural foundation and then there's what culture does. Um, like the fear of death. Every culture has to condition people in relation to the fear of death. And usually, and especially in these ancient societies, you were conditioned not to be afraid of death. And um, people would, older people would go out just eventually and expose themselves to the elements and let the younger generations have the resources necessary to survive. In our society, people cling to life. In the last couple of years of life, they just use incredible resources. And then the younger generation has no money for education or healthcare because all these old people are clinging to those last year or two of life, which I, I think is really irrational. And it's, it's norm, normalized in my society, and it's, it's preventing people from flourishing. Um, people are afraid of failing. They're afraid of economic failure. They're afraid of loss of social status, social ostracism. So it isn't just physical fears that we have. We have cultural fears, too. 
Um, generosity is a big one. So learning how to give, Aristotle says specifically money. So he thinks of a flourishing society has a strong and stable middle class. So everybody has a little bit more than they absolutely need. And nobody has too much or too little. And within that middle class, then they have enough money or material goods. And for my college students, I say time to volunteer or to give money or to give goods away because we actually depend on each other completely. We are social and political beings. So we have to act on that. And if we actually depend upon other people, we should give them money or food or our time just to live out the truth. Because if we don't, we're gonna start believing that we're more um, self-sufficient than we actually are. So generosity is good. Um, magnanimity is when someone has a whole lot of money. So this is Bill Gates and um, Mackenzie Scott, um, these super wealthy people who are now, they belong to a club, a billionaire's philanthropy club. And that's magnanimity. And like, and you, you can evaluate if they're giving their money away for the right reason in the right way at the right time. So there are people who are really, um, they're giving money away like to children with cancer or something without ever giving any money to preventing pollution and preventing the kind of um, plastics and pollution and all this crud that's causing the cancer in the first place. So there, there's what's called the, charity industrial complex where there are rich people who give money away but not really to help people flourish they give it to i don't know gain political um power they do it for ulterior motives um and then there's uh bill gates and his club that want to go green so their goal is carbon free so we have two sets of billionaires in this world. One is the fossil fuels forever, and it's the Charles Koch political machine. And then we have Bill Gates and his guys. And then we have Vandava Shiva is not a billionaire. <laughs> She's trying to, to do uh, regenerative agriculture. But anyway, um, that would be the issue is magnanimity which billionaires are giving for the right reason in the right way. And that is controversial. Um, even tempered is not getting too angry, but getting angry enough. So I remember when I read this, um, I, it had, you know, I never heard anybody say that, that you should get angry sometimes, right? We were just, no, you never get angry. You always forgive someone seven times, 70 times. Um, but he said, if you don't get angry, when you should get angry, you hold a grudge. <laughs> That's me. I hold grudges uh, because I shut up when, when I should get angry, but I remember, right? I remember what that person did. Um, so I do think that's true. And I think it's physiologically true. Aristotle was a, his dad was a doctor. So he's talking about a biological species, how it can maintain a healthy chemistry, body chemistry. Um, rational ambition means that you, you find out what your real talents are and you develop them, you get the degrees or you get the experience you need, and then you exercise that talent for the well being of everybody else. Okay, you're not exercising it just to get money, power, status for yourself. You have a talent, you develop it, and then you exercise it for the people who need it. Um, rational pride is knowing how to honor. Okay, so every institution has an honor day. 
And honor day is for people who go above and beyond what their job description is, right? They do all these other things to, to develop a high quality of life in, the, in their, where they work or where they live. And so that's rational pride is knowing that knowing how to honor people who are doing honorable things and knowing that you are honorable because you do go above and beyond. So you deserve to have pride for that. But people who are honorable tend not to want to be honored. They tend rather to worry about that other people get honored because people so easily misjudge and that gets politicized and it gets, people get jealous. And um, so somebody who really is honorable is not gonna worry about whether anybody else says so, right? They just worry that they make sure the honorable people they know get recognized. Um, rational humor is learning how to be a serious person, but take yourself lightly. Like we get in these situations that are so ridiculous and you can either get frustrated by them or because you know you wanna change the world and you can't, you can't, <laughs> some stupid thing happens, right? That gets in your way. Well, you have to learn how to laugh at some of that stupid stuff or you'll go crazy. Uh, rational friendships, um, you bond with someone based on a common desire to exercise one of the virtues, to achieve your rational ambitions, to inspire each other, to live a high quality of life. Um, and I, I think a lot of students do that. I think AUW students are constantly encouraging each other because they have so many obstacles, but I'm sure Lion students are too. Um, and that's as opposed to competing against them, right? that you work with them and that you, you know, everybody stays positive and keeps developing. Um, and then sociability is that you put up with minor injustices and truthfulness is that you, you know yourself. You don't uh, denigrate yourself. And then also the, the real problem is people who are deluded they think they're more important than they are. They think they're smarter than they are. They think they're more powerful than they are. And they do a lot of damage. <laughs> Self-deception is very harmful to anybody, you know, anybody who knows someone who's deluded. <laughs> I mean, the relationships are not very good. And then the social, it's a social disease too. So, those are mainly personal virtues. They definitely have an effect on other people, right? Because they're relational. You can't become a virtuous person, um, I mean, except in relation to other people, right? The two basic drives like sex and aggression, that comes from inside of you. And you're constantly self-examining, but you're exercising these virtues, you're taking that energy and using it in relationship to other people. So that, that's what makes us social and political creatures. But once we get a decent level of social interaction, the political virtues are the ones where the social virtues are in relation to people you know you interact with. The political virtues are a higher level of abstraction because you, when you're deciding about laws and how to create a middle class, what sort of laws, what sort of institutions, what sort of policies, you have to think about it in terms of the public, right? All the citizens. How can the citizens of America or Bangladesh or whatever, which decision is most likely to promote the flourishing of the most citizens over time? So which economic policies, right? What kind of a tax policy? What kind of a 
what sort of limits should there be on business? What sort of incentive structure should there be for business that would promote a middle class? The next one is um, making laws. And you can, make, you can make laws, you can make rules for an organization, you can have policies. There's just a lot of this stuff where everybody has to follow this so that the system as a whole, the group as a whole can function. Um, how to distribute wealth. And some of this is generosity, some of it is taxation, um, and people are different in what they need. So how do you allocate resources? Um, for example, if somebody decided they were gonna spend, I don't know, thousands, ten thousands of dollars so that I could get a PhD in math. <laughs> that would be a huge waste of money, right? I can't get a PhD in math because I don't have the smarts. <laughs> okay, but if there's a, a young woman in a village in Southeast Asia and she's really good at math, then, you know, that's how you would distribute wealth she would get the scholarship and she would be able to move forward and develop her natural ability. So distribution of wealth is tricky and we talk about it. People are always deliberating about what's the best way, how much government intervention in the market, how much should uh, taxes pay for education, for example, how much should taxes pay for healthcare, all of that is, about how to distribute wealth and social goods, the goods that we can get collectively or we need collectively. How about punishing wrongs, right? Every society has a limit. Um, people, different societies might define murder differently and they might define um, perversion differently, but every society has some idea of this is against the law, this is outside. How do, you, um, how do you punish? Do you punish in order to rehabilitate or do you punish just punitively, just to punish because you did something wrong? So you're going to, it's vindictive. Um, and then obviously people's ideas about what is evil or good or deviant or wrong change, right? So at one point being a homosexual was considered, you know, evil and it got punished. I think there's still countries where what, they get uh, killed or they, they just are considered to have chosen a very wicked way of life so that they have to get what, imprisoned or killed or whatever, but, uh, in, in societies where science governs the policies and the attitudes, um, people accept that some people are born with a different orientation, sexual orientation, and they don't get punished at all. As they are considered completely capable of being good citizens. They can be good employees, they can be good citizens, they can follow the laws, they can be self-controlled um, and some in some countries they can adopt children because they're not perverts they can raise children just as well as anybody else so people there are disagreements about uh, what should be legal or illegal but that's a constant process and it also depends upon scientific discoveries to some extent it depends, yes, there was a time when women were treated uh, completely erroneously because there was this belief that they were not equally intelligent. They just weren't, didn't have the capabilities that men have. So they shouldn't be ambitious because they don't have the ability. So that would be a waste of resources to give them opportunities, you know, and that was wrong. And so, Science came in there and genetics and you name it. And pretty soon, you know, people are reconsidering how they structure their societies. Then 
you have the laws and then you have a court, a case comes to court, the, the, the virtue of a judge or a jury is the ability to apply the law to a particular case. And of course, people disagree on what sort of punishment or whether the judge make it, made a good decision. And then there's enforcing the law, right? So there's different ways of enforcing the laws too. Okay, so we have all that is the general pattern. And then practical wisdom means that in a particular situation, you know that the goal is human flourishing and you set up what are my options or what are the country's options that are apps that are possible. We don't talk about utopias and we don't talk about dystopias. We talk about what's possible, which one of those possibilities is most likely to lead to flourishing and why. So that's deliberation. And once you've come to a conclusion, you have to communicate. You have to be able to persuade everybody who involved to make the choice, to go along with the choice or to contribute to that choice. That's really hard. <laughs> this is really difficult. Um, I, I would not be good at, at a kind of job where the leadership, everybody looks up to a leader, they have to make a decision that has all sort of ripple effects and they have to make it within a certain time frame, and they have to persuade other people. I am no good at almost any of those things. You wouldn't pick me for that kind of a job. Um, but it is, I respect it, right? I can identify it. Um, well, my son runs a charter school and he was just talking to me uh, about some decisions that he'd made and how the faculty are responding and all this stuff. Um, so yeah, I would just hate to be in his shoes. I, my, my children can do things that I can't do, <laughs> probably because they were raised with parents who couldn't do these things. They started having to do these things, and that's why they're pretty good at it. I don't know. Anyway, so then the art of production is you create uh, artifacts, right? This would be, you know, things that you can sell for profit or... Um, but the, if you're rational, you just sell things that people need and you sell them well-crafted, right? You put your mind into it. It's beautiful. It's ordered. It's something people need like pottery or um, furniture or something like that. And um, yeah, and that can get abused, right? that you shoes, for example, how about shoes that actually help your feet, not high heel pointed toes. Shoes are um, a corruption of the skill of shoemaking. Um, and then there's the intellectual virtues, math, science, knowledge. And so the intellectual virtues are the ones that you think of when you come to college or you go to school. It's the stuff you learn in a classroom with a teacher, uh, maybe you take a test, um, but the traditional liberal arts education educates for character. And so you, you have a number of habits that you come to school with, but the liberal education part is that you re-examine all those habits and you decide how you wanna exercise these virtues. And then you get your intellectual training but you tie that to what you think is the, a virtuous way of life. So um, the intellectual virtues have to be connected to an idea of the good, the good life, an idea of human destiny, human flourishing, and your particular place, what you can contribute to the goal of flourishing. So that's the difference at least in outline of a liberal arts education versus um, just an education for a professional skill. Okay, so then I had all, you know, I made you read all this stuff and I hope it wasn't too difficult. It was a lot easier than giving you some pages from Aristotle, 
But uh, again, I have office hours the next few nights if you want to go through that more carefully. And then the last page is these questions. So give an example of a person um, of high moral standards who has what, you know, some virtue you think they have, like a person you think is particularly generous or particularly courageous or particularly um, even tempered. So you can, that's the first question. Second one is six people who either you know or they're in the public eye who have our standouts for some of these virtues or vices, right? There are certain people who are notorious for being sexual perverts or notorious for being self-indulgent or um, anyway, that's, that's the second question. Um, the third one has to do with, um, you. if it's virtuous, you have to choose it. You have to know what you're doing, choose it for its own sake and from a firm character. So um, let's see, you can decide, right? You can decide that I'm going to eat virtuously. I'm not gonna to eat too much, too little. I'm gonna I'm gonna go on a diet, right? Because I wanna look good in a swimming suit next year, right? <laughs> that's, that's the wrong reason, <laughs> okay? You, the only reason you should want to eat differently is because you wanna be healthy. That would be the only real reason. Uh, but of course, people do things. So they act virtuously. It appears to be virtuous, but it actually has an ulterior motive. Um, on the other hand, people can um, perform. Uh, yeah, so you give an example of something that appears to be virtuous, but the, the agent has an ulterior motive. Um, three friends you have. And one's based on usefulness. They're your friend because they're useful. They're a good study partner. One is based on pleasure. I just like to, I could like, I go and have fun with that person, but I don't really, I'm not friends with them. I just think they're funny. And on Friday nights, we go to parties and they're funny. They're the life of the party. <laughs> and then some that you think, are virtuous and that's what binds you together, right? You do volunteer work together or um, you create, I, I know that at Lion, there's this whole project of, of making murals down in downtown Batesville, making murals together. Um, there's there's a, lot of, a lot of different things. Um, so then the last one is, um, linking um, Christianity with these virtues, these humanistic. Okay, so I'll wait, we can wait on that one because I would like you to, to link Muhammad or Confucius or Buddha or Socrates, but let's just wait on that one. And let's just do the first uh, four. No, the first, yeah, the first four or any other thing that you wanted to talk about in, in your groups, right? So I'm hoping that you came with something you wanted to talk about. And then after I've talked, you have other things you want to talk about in your groups. So I'm going to give you 15 minutes. And um, I hope, you know, if you run out of stuff to say, then you can, um, come back and tell me that. But after about 14 minutes, I'll break in and say, would you want more time or not? Because I think at this point in the class, you can get into some good discussions, right? You don't need me to sit here and blather all day. Um, so let's just try that. And then just be honest. If you are done, you're done. And if you really want more time, you just tell me you want more time. Okay, so the next section, and I think I'm gonna collapse. Well, I guess I'll start with one half of it, put you back in groups for 10 minutes, and then the final part.
part of it. Um, I would like you in your second uh, set of groups to have everybody who didn't talk the first time talk the second time, but everybody has to get engaged, right? You can't, other people can't just sit and hope that you'll speak. So everybody needs to speak and say something. Um, so this one is about um, somebody you, you admire and um, I, someone was talking about their coaches and that's great, but if for the moment, it would be a prominent person in the public eye or Socrates, Jesus, Mohammed, Buddha, Martin Luther King, Gandhi, somebody who your society uh, associates with the highest virtue might be your religion. So this is just to sort of anticipate what we're going to actually study. And um, the idea of wisdom is that wisdom only reminds you of what you already know. So I, so I think you already know all this stuff because it's been beating in the back of your head as a pattern. You just haven't noticed necessarily that it is a pattern and that all of these singular events actually follow a model in some sense, or they arise out of a model. So without anybody consciously, you know, saying so or trying to stick it into some model, it just sort of flows that way. So there's uh, Socrates notion of God, there's Jesus notion, there's Muhammad's notion, obviously, there's Buddha's notion, you name it, you fill in the gap. Um, the personal virtues that Socrates had these virtues. Um, I will just talk about Socrates right now, just because this would be the last one on Socrates. And then we'll probably bring up Jesus. Well, I'll bring up Jesus later on. Um, so uh, Socrates had a reputation for enjoying food, but he never overate. He um, could drink as much as anyone, but he never got drunk. <laughs> And he was monogamous in his case. Um, but Aristotle, you know, this model of humanism is that sex is fine. There's nothing to feel guilty about. It's just too much, too little. Um, abstinence is not natural, right? And then uh, monogamy, children need a stable household to grow up in. Um, so Yes, the goal would be to have the parents of the children raising the children, although not in a, the nuclear family is not as natural as an extended family. So anyway, drinking too much or too little. And to some extent, people disagree on too much drinking or too little. But there is the, I mean, experts say that a lot of people think they're just social drinkers and they deny that they're actually emotionally dependent on alcohol to sort of lubricate their relationships. When you get to the point where you can't relate to people unless you have had a drink, then you're in trouble. Um, but anyway, so in uh, Islam, there's no drinking at all, but the Greeks, they don't have very many absolute prohibitions. Everything is too much, too little, and eating um, too much, too little, the right reason in the right way at the right time, blah, blah, the right amount of protein, blah, blah. Um, and then if you really have the virtue, you, you want to do that. You take pleasure in the fact that you don't want to do anything uh, apart from what's best. That's the ultimate virtue. It's called, it's integrity. You've integrated your desires and your knowledge, and it's a part of your character. The second best is what's called moral strength, which is you don't really want to eat right all the time, but you do it just out of strength, right? That's not perfect integrity because you have to go against what you desire. Um, the third one is moral weakness, that you know what's right, 
and you don't want to do it, and then you give in to your desires, right? But people who are morally weak tend to repent. <laughs> they tend to be teachable. They tend to be able to change. People who are self-indulgent don't even know what's right. <laughs> they think it's okay to do this or that, and it's not, and they lose their health, or they, you know, lose, end up driving drunk, or they lose their relationships because they don't, uh, somebody trusted them to have a meaningful sexual relations and they break trust. Okay, things like that. And they don't even think it's wrong. So that's self-indulgence. Um, courage. So both uh, Socrates and Jesus, and Muhammad and Buddha, they stood up to the authority figures. They questioned them. They exposed their hypocrisy or their small mindedness. Um, in, in Socrates' case, it was the authorities in every sector of society, if you remember. He brought up just last time I was talking about all the different sectors and they got corrupted. Socrates was out there in the agora trying to hold them accountable. Um, in Jesus' case, it was the religious authorities that he was up, he confronted. These would be the people with power, money, and status in the religious sector of society or the legalists, fundamentalists. Um, they both allowed themselves to be killed. They forgave their murderous murders because the cause is ignorance. And it leads to delusions, self-deceptions. Um, people resented them because they were virtuous and they made those people look bad. Um, both are religious innovators. They had different idea of God. They didn't have the traditional idea, whatever that is. Um, generosity, they all, all these people, Muhammad, Confucius, they have goodwill. They, they don't take revenge. Sometimes they get angry for the right reason in the right way. Um, Muhammad did, um, Socrates did um, honor. They all knew what was honorable, but they didn't seek their own glory or honor. Um, they both worked as hard as they could to try to get people to re-examine their lives, which is they both confronted people who were much higher in status than them. So that could be perceived as ambitious, um, but they themselves didn't want any of those things, but they had the ambition to go and speak to those people, right? They didn't think they were beneath even questioning them. Uh, they both called out people for blaming other people and not looking inward at their own flaws. Um, uh, they all, I'll say all of them had friends or disciples who loved them, but they died not knowing if anyone understood their way of life and would pass it down to posterity. They're all sociable. They get along with people as much as they can. They don't create conflict, but they don't avoid necessary conflict. Uh, they all tried to bring about a spiritual renewal. By spiritual, I mean living for the sake of something greater than yourself, justice, virtue, beauty, um, uh, wilderness preservation, leaving a better world behind. Those are all what I would call spiritual in the Greek sense of daimonic uh, renewal. Uh, they wanted to motivate and inspire people to want to focus on something greater than themselves. They both were, they all were, knew that themselves, they were humble. They admitted that they knew their own capacity for making mistakes. They weren't judgmental. Um, and they criticized other people for being too judgmental. In the political virtues, they get caught up in political issues because those that they offend use their legal systems to take them to court uh, to manipulate the masses into voting. So they themselves were focused on a spiritual life. Everybody 
living a more flourishing life. They call out corruption, but they, they weren't pay, playing political games, but people played political games with them and used them as part of their political agenda. Um, in each of these cases, the original lawmakers had a good legal system. There wasn't a problem with the system. This is mostly Socrates, I think. Um, so, oh yeah, okay, with Jesus too. Pontius Pilate didn't think Jesus was a criminal, um, but the religious leaders were dead set to get him crucified. Um, Jesus, uh, Socrates likes Athens system. It was the Athenians that abused it. Um, Jesus liked Judaism. It was the, the Jews, the leaders that were the problem. Um, Socrates was the most pious and humble because he didn't think he knew what he didn't know. He wasn't proud, but he was condemned for being impious. Um, the Roman laws, okay. Athenians had allowed the citizens to believe anything they wanted. Um, let's see, the criminal justice system was corrupted, obviously, in Socrates' case. Um, equity applying laws. So the jury didn't apply the law very well. The punishment didn't fit the crime. If Socrates is the greatest gift and Jesus, had they have the same basic virtues, can we say, in Mohammed, okay, or Buddha, can you say that those people's lives really promote um, a democratic society? And we'll go over that more later. And then I have the founding fathers of the US. But I, I, since we have students that are from all over the place, we don't have to do that much with um, the US. Let me see though, let me go to this, if this is all right. It's okay, it's about, she's arguing that there's a certain puritanical strain in the US and it's connected to this polarization. So I want those of you who aren't American and you're not Christian, right? You're just to think about if you're Muslim or Buddhist or humanist or whatever, are there puritanical branches of humanism or any of these religions that have a emotionally repressed absolutist kind of thinking fundamentalist blaming the other guy for being the source of evil as opposed to humanist that's what i really want to get you humanism ancient classical humanism is um you're in touch with your emotions you're not repressed you don't divide the world into good and evil. You keep these conversations going like Socrates did, constantly re-examining. So she doesn't talk about that so much, but hopefully this will click in. This will be relevant to all of you. It's hard for me to keep If you're 55 and thinking, up, she mobilized uh, plans go just for you. Whether you need a single line or lines for family members, You'll get great value on America's most reliable 5G network. Like two lines of unlimited for just $27.50 a line. That's our everyday price. Plus, our plans always come with unlimited talk text data included. So switch to T-Mobile and get two lines of unlimited for only $27.50 a line. That's half the price of Verizon or AT&T. Only at T-Mobile, the leader in 5G. The new Puritans. And it discusses the rise of mob justice in today's culture and its long-term effects. And you write in part this. The modern online public sphere, a place of rapid conclusions, rigid ideological prisms, and arguments of 280 characters, favors neither nuance nor ambiguity. Yet the values of that online sphere have come to dominate many American cultural institutions, universities, newspapers, foundations, museums. Okay, and then for those of you who aren't American, I want you to think, is this also true in your country or not? Um, obviously, the Taliban has a reputation for being uh, ideological, rigid ideologically, right? But I think, you know, the rest of you... I don't think 
you are a former Taliban or anything like that. It's just a pattern, right? And so you, I am really curious to know with the AUW students, do you think that the social media is actually opening up people and making them more thoughtful and aware, or is it also polarizing people like it is in the US? I'm really curious about this because, I mean, there could be fundamentally different uh, answers to that question. Heeding public demands for rapid retribution, they sometimes impose the equivalent of a lifetime scarlet letter on people who have not been accused of anything remotely resembling a crime. Instead of courts, they use secretive bureaucracies. Instead of hearing evidence and witnesses, they make judgments behind closed doors. This is a story of moral panic, of cultural institutions policing or purifying themselves in the face of disapproving crowds. The crowds are no longer literal, as they once were in Salem, but rather online mobs organized by, our, by a Twitter, Facebook, or sometimes internal company Slack channels. And, and, and by the way, the victims of this mob justice are certainly not confined to the right. Uh, so many are also on the left, whether in media or whether uh, in academic circles, wherever it is. And it was an eye-opening piece. You know, it's interesting, years ago, uh, probably about a decade ago, I started noticing uh, sort of this moral self-righteousness and moral training that had been associated with the far right uh, popping up on the far left. And I, I, I talked about how some of the things I was seeing from the far left uh, starting about a decade ago, reminded me of when I went to my grandmom's house and she would have on the PTL club. And uh, I was watching Jim and Tammy Faye Baker. Uh, you go a little bit further back for your uh, historical parallel, the Puritans, explain. Yes, yeah, so as you know, I've written quite a bit about illiberalism on the right. Um, and this piece was an attempt to understand a somewhat different phenomenon, which is liberalism inside cultural institutions, which sometimes comes from what you could call the laughter or what you could call um, the, the, you know, a new group of young people trying to think differently. Um, but what it reminds me of is not so much institutions in the past, you know, when governments tried to impose a set of ideas or created laws or instituted censorship, what it looks like and what it feels like if you're part of it, and I talked to many of people who were on various sides of the argument, what it feels like is a, a kind of massive, intense form of social conformism. Um, and the book that I wound up rereading in order to understand it was the book The Scarlet Letter, which is an American classic. Many of you probably read it in school. Uh, and it describes how a small town gangs up on a woman who's been accused of adultery, makes her wear a scarlet letter, ostracizes her, and kicks her out of the community. Um, even though, as it turns out in the course of the book, other people are guilty, men know one is completely innocent, many other people in the town have also committed sins, but they identify her as the, as the one who deserves punishment. And this, I think, is what it feels like to people who wind up on the wrong side of one of these arguments. Um, they are ostracized, they lose their jobs, sometimes they lose their livelihoods, uh, sometimes they lose all their friends. Um, and often, as, 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 as in, the, in the passage that you read out, after procedures that are unclear or anonymous or conducted behind closed doors, sometimes they understand very little about it. Um, and that feels to me you know, deeply unfair. It's something coming out of America's deep past and Ending it is going to require that we begin to think differently about how we judge people, and in particular, how we rely on these or, or, or learn to live with these social media mobs mm -hmm. that sometimes attack people. And, and, and Mika, uh, Anne, in the piece, talks about how social codes are changing and how many of the people accused obviously uh, did things that uh, we should find abhorrent. Uh, right. at, at the at the same time, uh, obviously, uh, you have to sort through these accusations and actually apply, you know, some due process and fairness to it. Well, that's what I wanted to ask, Anne. If you could describe the people that you spoke to for this piece, that is incredibly thoughtful, and I do think everybody should read it. Um, you know, what is the description of uh, of who these people are, and whatever any of them have wanted to share their names. 
So I did talk to a range of people. Some people did share their names. Um, many of them did not, either because they fear once again being attacked online or because they're involved in complicated legal issues or lawsuits with their institutions. Um, they range a lot, actually. Some of them are journalists. Some of them were people in academia. Some people were in other, you know, in, in foundations. Um, and I talked to people who were on both sides of this. So I talked to some people who were victims, um, who described how they, you know, their friends and contacts and professional life disappeared overnight. And I also talked to some administrators who've had to deal with these issues and who've also found them very difficult um, and, and, and found them very hard to work through. Um, I mean, one of the things I found was that usually these stories are really complicated. Um, they're very, you can't summarize them in one sentence. Um, and there are a lot of other issues involved, you know, jealousy or competition or um, people trying to get back at other people. And this was also, by the way, typical of very conformist societies where, um, you know, it's, people are attacked for all kinds of reasons other than the ostensible one. Um, and I also found that a lot of them are people who are um, what we would use the term perhaps difficult or sometimes gregarious. They were people who stood out in some way. They were people sometimes who bothered other people. They, they sometimes demanded a lot of their students or their colleagues. They had, there, were, there was something about them that often created this, some kind of dissension around them, um, which of course doesn't mean they deserve to be <laughs> eliminated from public life. Um, and usually, again, the ostensible reason, the, the, the thing they're accused of is not usually- I just wanna say, does this remind you of Socrates, okay? <laughs> He, you know, he was a little weird and he got accused of things and the thing wasn't necessarily the thing that was bogging them. They were just using him as a scapegoat. Yeah, right. He was the one to blame. The whole story um, and the whole stories are very complicated. Gene Robinson's with us, Anne, and that's a question for you, Gene. Yeah, and I, I guess my question is, um, it, it, is this a, a, a qualitatively different process from what's always happened? Is this new because of social media and the speed and, 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 and volume of con condemnation uh, that, that comes? Or is it, um, is it the fact that every generation defines its, its sort of values and mores um, and that the younger generation, um, whatever that generation happens to be at the time, um, tends to win those battles because it lives longer. Um, and, and so if uh, whenever I hear people our age, um, uh, you know, talking about these kids today and how uh, censorious they are and, and, and how politically correct they are and this and that, um, I, I, I keep thinking that, well, you know, in 30, 40 years, we're not gonna be around. They're gonna be around. They're, they're gonna win this argument. Isn't that the case? Um, first of all, I do think that the speed of social media and the nature and the nature of these online mobs is different from anything that we've had before. Um, and second of all, I worry that um, people in that generation, younger people, are just as much the victims of this as people our age. It's not confined to one age group. I mean, there is some gen generational conflict here, but that's not the only thing happening. Um, and and the concern is not that you know, their values are different from mine or something like that. The concern is that the, the atmosphere of intellectual life in a lot of institutions is frozen. People are afraid to say things. They're afraid to publish things. Um, they, they don't talk to one another. Um, there's topics that can't be brought up. Um, you know, one uh, Yale professor told me about a history, an, institute, an incident from history that he used to discuss with his students that he doesn't discuss anymore because he's afraid it will offend them. Um, and that means that we have, you know, we have, a, we have universities, we have schools, we have other institutions where things that actually happen, you know, um, difficult subjects aren't dealt with. Um, and that does bode ill for the rest of us and it's worth discussing and confronting, um, honestly. Boy, this is so important. Uh, Walter, let's talk to you. You, you live uh, around college students. Uh, Meek and I decided to do something different this summer, uh -oh. uh, actually talk to people, invite friends over <laughs> to dinner. And I, I can't tell you, 
every dinner discussion somehow always got back to this. It's true. And uh, and and most of the people that were talking about it, surprisingly enough, were uh, left of center people who were going to take their kids out of New York City schools, were left of center kids who had sent their uh, left of center parents who had sent their kids to boarding schools, left of center ki- uh, parents who sent their kids to the best schools. They're all taking their kids out of these schools. The kids, they, uh, 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 but I was, I was thinking that this was just an age issue and thinking like, Gene, well, maybe we're just old and this is the future. And then Mika and I had some college students visiting with parents. The most frightening thing yeah. I heard came from them. And you know what they said, Walter? We don't talk in class anymore. We don't have public discussions anymore. If you say one wrong thing, you're lit up on social media and your social life at school is over. And we heard this time and again, it made me sick because for those who went to college when we went to college, it's about saying stupid things in class, about getting it terribly wrong and about about, about about getting your pre-existing prejudices and getting your idiotic ideas out on the table, having it discussed, and you growing as a person. That is not happening now at so many colleges because the students are scared to death to talk, go up on social media, and be canceled. What do we do about that? You know, I teach at Tulane, and we talk about that all the time now. I have a class that I'm teaching now, American History Through the Law. And like Ann Applebaum, I start with the Salem Witch Trials. I start with Hawthorne, and then the trial of Ann Hutchinson, people who were pushed out because of cancel culture back then. And I try to make sure, I say in the very first class, we got a couple of weeks ago, there's 75 people in the class. I say, let's talk about cancel culture. Let's be upfront about this. And I have found, now this is down here in Tulane, I have found that students are very much pushing back in the direction, saying, we want to speak out. We don't want to be afraid. And I say, okay. At Metro, my team, we don't think. Okay. So, I would like you to get into groups to talk about this. And um, I did have a student from AUW tell me after a class that she didn't want me to post it on YouTube because she had said something in the class and that other AUW students might find it and start trashing her. And I don't even remember what she said, Uh, but that's another reason for a breakout group, right? That you can say stuff. So I, I hope that in your breakout groups, you really tried to do have these discussions. But my main, my main point as a teacher of Greek culture is that when she says it's illiberal, she's using that word liberal exactly the way that these Greek virtues are, right? Is that you have to talk about this stuff. You're always talking about well, what's the temperate thing? What's the courageous thing? And people are disagreeing. All the Greek tragedies, Homer, Plato, they're all like that. And so the whole Socratic thing, right? That was liberalism. When they killed Socrates, they basically killed liberalism. So that I do want to convey to you that that is what I think is important. And it is the opposite of Puritanism. Then I want the ones who are not from the US to just talk about or think about um, the fact that in their country, you can have culture that is more puritanical and repressed and black and white. And then you can have a culture that's more humanistic and liberal in this ancient uh, view. So why don't you get into groups and it just be a couple minutes for today But I would like to keep this conversation going. And so if you want to write some more stuff down in your post, and then we can pick up at the next class about the notion of liberal and the classical virtues and how it's just this constant process of examination. So let me put you back in those groups just for a minute um, so that you can give each other a few ideas. And then when you have to go you just go. (laughs) 
and I'll bring everyone back at uh, in about five minutes. Um, there you go. Okay. Felipe, can you join your group, group one? Oops. Everybody should hold that thought. And when we get back into groups, I definitely want you to keep the conversation going. So go ahead and put the stuff in your post. And then you can formulate, you know, what did I get out of this class? And then I'll, we'll just pick it right up because the notion of liberal and liberal education, this is it guys. <laughs> and um, that's what's important. We will talk about this for the rest of the semester. Uh, Lion College, actually the mission statements of both AUW and Lion both really affirm some notion of liberal. And I, I will post that on, on today's post for you because I've, I've, I usually teach that. I just remind students of the ideas of the people that founded the institution. Anyway, I've got to let you go, but this is, this is big. And we aren't going to save our democracy unless we learn to be liberal in this sense. 
And the rest of you aren't gonna be able to cultivate a democracy unless people are willing to listen to each other and be patient with complexity. So, okay, I look forward to reading your posts and if anyone wants to stay after, but I know a lot of you have class now, so um, take care, stay safe, don't do anything that goes against science, okay? Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye, professor. Bye-bye.